Don't be so. Well, we're all here. Not everybody has their video on, and we have one person who's by phone only. Um, so why don't we open up our Northampton Planning Board meeting on September 23rd, 2021. Um, and this meeting is being recorded. Um, we will open up our meeting with an opportunity for public comment for anybody here in the audience who'd like to address the planning board about an issue that's not on our agenda, which are a couple of zoning amendments, discussions, and a, uh, a request for a site plan up on Lady Slipper Lane. So is there anyone in the audience who has other comments to make for the planning board? All right, we got that nice to be out of the way. Um, so we have six planning board members here, seven, um, which is definitely a quorum. So why don't we open up a seven o'clock public hearing for a site plan by Wright Builders to construct a second residential unit at 15 Lane Slipper Lane, Northampton, Mass, map ID 35248. Um, and is the applicant or the applicant's representative here to make a little presentation? I am. Hi, I'm Ryan Crandall. I'm Vice President of Project Development at Wright Builders. Uh, and if I can share my screen, I can bring up some of my... Can you all see that okay? Okay, uh, so thank you for taking the time to review this tonight. Uh, we're proposing a new single family dwelling unit, uh, which is attached by roof canopies to an existing sing single family home at 15 Lady Slipper Lane. Uh, the site is within the WSP zoning district. Uh, the new accessory structure will maintain the primary structure property setbacks, uh, which is 15 on the sides, 20 in front, uh, and, and mainly that 15 foot side yard setback is the closest to the property line, uh, which we can see uh, over here. Uh, so we'll be more than maintaining that. Uh, we are tucking that unit back behind the existing garage, which is this rectangle here. And then this is the main house, uh, which you see over in the corner here. Uh, and then this is the floor plan, uh, a little bit better rendition. Uh, so this is st this studio apartment will be used by the current property owner's mother. Uh, she's moved here from uh, Nevada to Northampton to be closer to family during the pandemic. Uh, she's lived independently in Nevada for 50 years plus, uh, and she strives to maintain that independent lifestyle. Uh, the accessory unit will provide her with just that. Uh, she's, um, you know, and it'll allow her family to assist her with daily tasks that she needs. Um, she also feels significantly safer while living here with her family in Northampton. Um, she's looking for that extra space that is her own home. Um, and that's the purpose of this is to, is to serve that for her. Um, and this is especially true, you know, sentiment toward, towards Asian Americans has been inappropriately and negatively affected. Um, you know, they've been affected by this speculation around the virus origin, and she's just felt uh, significantly safer in this town. So thank you to everyone in Northampton for making her feel that way. And <laughs> just wanna put that out there. Uh, this accessory apartment aligns with Northampton's goals of creating a whole home for older homeowners. Uh, while also providing companionship and minimizing the need for an assisted living for uh, you know, as long as possible for her. Uh, with regards to the future use of the apartment, uh, the current homeowners see themselves actually moving into this uh, studio and letting their children take over the home um, and being able to use that apartment as they grow older. Uh, again, this just aligns with Northampton's goals of establishing accessory apartments that serve various stages of the lifestyle uh, of the family. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Uh, this also allows them to stay at the property um, in the Northampton area community uh, for many years to come. Uh, if the family cannot use the unit for some reason, uh, there's also potential for it to become a moderately priced rental unit. Uh, it could serve, serve students or teachers or anyone of the sort in the area. Um, and it could be an accessible rental unit, uh, which would serve the community well as well. Uh, the unit's about 480 square feet of living space with uh, covered outdoor area here and a ramp going up into the existing screen porch uh, that we're also redoing. So very easy access into the main home um, to be able to you know, give, her, uh, give her help as she needs it. Uh, so the entrance is, as I said before, is uh, back behind the existing garage. Uh, it's that covered ramp uh, that goes up into the new home. Uh, we intend for it to be used by a single person or two people. Um, we don't expect that three people would ever be able to inhabit this, but it is possible, I suppose. Uh, but no more than that, that's for sure. Uh, there is not great solar access to this unit uh, just because of tree coverage on site. Uh, however, our standards um, have allowed it to surpass the minimum HERS ratings that are required by code. It gets a 47 um, and it's also fossil fuel free. So if we can put solar on the main home in the future, uh, we expect that this would offset, um, would be able to offset this unit. Um, all utilities will be shared with the primary home. Um, so there's no additional uh, requirements for the city uh, or for the homeowners to cut into the street. <clears throat> uh, and there's also no additional curb cuts that are needed as the driveway provides access right to this unit uh, and she'll be able to use either the garage or park directly in front of her space. Uh, and there's significant parking on site as well. Uh, the driveway loops around from the street. So more than enough uh, parking there for everyone in the house. Uh, there'll be minimal, minimal impact to the daily driving and traffic uh, during and after construction. Uh, traffic to the home will actually probably decrease just because they won't have to be leaving to uh, go take care of her. Uh, they can do that all right on site. Uh, rainwater runoff for the new roof will be captured by gutters and downspouts and then dispersed on site uh, into an, a depressed area around the side here and back of the unit. Uh, and that's the existing uh, stormwater runoff is in this same area. Um, so anything would be added to that would be, would be maintained on site. Uh, and we can see it here in our uh, new septic plan. You can see those grades drop off and come back into this area here. Uh, the septic plan has been approved by Board of Health pending the planning board approval. Uh, the design uh, actually adds a new tank here and then a new line entering prior to the D box. And then we're also adding a new lateral line to uh, the field to accommodate the uh, additional uh, tank and, and usage here. Uh, we feel this you know, this uh, unit will have a positive impact on Northampton for many years to come. And I hope everyone else feels the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, short and sweet. Um, are there any questions for, from the board members before we move on to the public comment? All right. Okay, so hearing none, um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak regarding this application on Lady Clipper Lane? Please kind of raise your hand either by using the uh, reaction button down on your toolbar or just physically raise your hand. Could we go back to the full screen, Ryan or Sharon? The uh, gallery. Oh, of sorry, yep. Stop sharing. 
All right. Again, is there anyone there in the audience who would like to speak for or against the uh, application? Okay. Planning board members, any questions for the applicant? Oh boy. Caleb, what's your role in this presentation, if I might be so curious? Um, I'm just a uh <clears throat> I'm just a UMass student who's um just I'm a regional master's of regional planning student, so I'm just kind of sitting in on these types of meetings. Great. Great. Thank Good you for having me. I appreciate it. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um Ryan, I guess I'll ask it. This is a pretty straightforward thing, and right, it fits into exactly what the city was hoping for and with these ABUs, even in the watershed protection area. Did the uh the homeowner or right builders have any discussion with the butters about the plan? Yeah, so they had spoken to all of their abutters, uh, except for one who has been out on vacation for the last couple of weeks. Um, but he was trying to speak with them at a, a 11 Lady Slipper Lane, I believe it was. Uh, I'm not positive if he had that communication with them, but uh, everyone else seemed to be happy for them that this is the direction they're going. Great. Thank you. Okay, hearing not a lot of commotion or questions about this, is there a motion to close the public hearing? I'd move to close the public hearing. A second. Thanks, Marissa. Seconded by Jana. All right, um, any discussion? Remember that once we close the public hearing, we can't ask any questions of the presenters. Okay. So because we're in a Zoom meeting, we have a uh, an individual roll call. Um, so I'll I'll start that up. Um, the motion's been made to close the public hearing. How do you feel about that, Chris? Yes. All right, Jenna. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. And uh, Marissa. Yes. And David. Yes. And Sam Taylor. Yes. Okay, and the chair agrees too, so that's unanimous. Thank you. So that's closing the public comment session. Now we'll perhaps have a motion to approve or deny this application. If there are no other questions. I, I view to, to approve the approve the, the building of on Lady Slipper Lane. On 22 later Silver Lane. Okay, or actually it's um 15, I believe. Yes, 15. Is it 15 Lady Slipper Lane? That's what I meant. That's that's what I said. I fully said that. I feel like Thank I said you. That. Well, I, I just really build another it. another place on another address. Just build it yeah, where we tell you. We can do that. <laughs> we'll happily do that. Yeah. Uh, I would second that. Right. I mean the the approval at the right address. I would say. Okay. So <laughs> motion has been made to approve the application at 15 Lady Slipper Lane. There are no conditions that on the applicant at this point. It's pretty straightforward. Is there any discussion about the motion? I have I have one comment. I have, um, I think it's a great project and and look you know hope it all goes well. Um, I do want to say something just because we have someone from the world of academia or people who might be interested in the planning process. Um, while I, I think the project is great, I really take issue with the presentation of this project as being for some very nice people and all the specifics about them. Not that those people shouldn't have a successful project, they should, but none of that has any bearing on this project. And uh, I wouldn't want anybody who was watching this hearing to think that if you weren't uh, a little nice old lady or something, uh, you don't get approval. Uh, you don't have to be any of those things to get approved. For a project that has nothing to do with the project. So uh, for all of you listening, <laughs> the uh, ownership and the uh, personalities of the people who are applying uh, are, are not what we're looking at here. So anyway, approved on my part. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you, David. Point well taken. Any other discussion? Okay, motion's been made and seconded to approve this application. Um, so we'll move to a roll call vote. And I'll start up with Chris again. Yes. And Jana? Yes. Okay, Melissa? Yes. And Marissa? 
Yes. And David? Yes. Okay, and uh, Sam Taylor? Yes. Okay, and the chair also votes yes. Um, so thank you very much for coming to, uh, with your application. Good luck in the project. Good luck to the homeowners. Thank you. And we'll move on to our next agenda item. Um, <clears throat> I see we are just joined by uh, uh, Kathy Townsend. I hope you weren't here for the application of Lady Slipper Lane. We just finished that one. So no, now, I wasn't. I'm here for the Conservation Commission. Um, is that happening soon? Um, Carolyn, do you want to address that? Um, sure. Let's see. So you're here for the Conservation Commission meeting? No, for the, um, am I, do I have the wrong day? The uh, um, public hearing, uh, Thursday, September 23rd on the zoning amendments. Oh, that's, you're at the right meeting. It's not right. the Conservation Commission. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. Uh, okay. Is that what's happening now or is it coming up? It's just coming up now, Ms. Townsend. Thank you so right. much. Your timing is good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to open a public hearing on proposed zoning amendments. Um, Carolyn, I, I assume you want to just take them the way that they're laid out in the agenda, which would be uh, the first one modify 350.17 Farms, Forests, and Rivers. Sure. Okay. Before we start these, Carolyn, could you just give us a little background on why these are coming up at this point? What was kind of, how did this bubble up now? Um, okay, so the first um, public hearing item is to um, modify the section of the existing zoning um, that we refer to as Farms, Forests, and Rivers. Um, it's currently in chapter 350, um, section 17. And it's, it's interesting you say, why is this coming up now? Um, it's sort of been a work in progress for several years. You all may remember that a few years ago, um, the city started an effort to rezone city owned property. Um, that came into conservation and permanent protection that way through city ownership, rezone it out of um, the underlying the existing zone that those properties had into farms, forests, and rivers to reflect more of uh, the fact that it's no longer a residential um, zoning district. So all of the current uh, all, so at, uh, we've done it, um, we did the first chunk was sort of was rezoning all the open space that had been in city holdings um, for years. So Fitzgerald Lake, um, Sawmill Hills, Mineral Hills, all of those areas were brought into farms, forests and rivers. And then as we, over time, as uh, the city acquires more property in little bits around the city, um, we would bring a group of parcels um, to you and to the city council to have those parcels rezoned to farms, forests, and rivers. Um, and during those that time, uh, we felt that eventually it would be appropriate to look at other open space. So either that's owned by the state that's publicly um, open uh, parks and recreation areas or areas that are permanently protected for open space, either for agricultural production or for um, um, uh, other kinds of conservation or farming. So the parcels in front of you today are, um, this, this is a two part zoning amendment. The first part is to rework the text because the tech, the, the zoning district farms, forest rivers has been on the books for 25, 30 years. Um, and it was originally, um, the status was really to, to create a, a place for property that was um, transferred 
development rights from other parcels in other parts of the city. And that never really came to pass. There was a little bit of uh, working with that around the state hospital parcels before the state hospital was redeveloped. But the transfer of development rights um, function has never really um, captured or been utilized, I guess I should say. So the idea is to rework the definition of what farms, forests, and rivers are and also sort of get rid of the transfer of development rights function because it's a very complicated um, almost too wonky thing for anybody anywhere around the country to use. It's very complicated. And so it doesn't make sense for us to keep that. So um, I will put, if it helps, I can put the text changes first up on the screen um, and then um, go from there. Let me just pull up um, and show you sort of as we're talking about bringing in other parcels, not just city um, open space, what does it mean to make these changes to the text to sort of allow more flexibility in the uses of these properties? Um, so let's see here if I can grab, oops, let me just pull up my farms, forests, and rivers thing. There we go. Okay. Okay, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Can you all see that? Yep. Um, so um, as I said, we've had this section in the code for a long time. And the idea is to really change it to farms, forests, and recreation, because um, we're pulling in also active recreation parcels um, into this. So it would include, um, you know, um, Arcanum Field and some other recreation areas. Um, and so we've taught this amendment looks at changing the definition of what this district is and really to identify um, that these districts are not primarily for residential development. And so by bringing the properties that are permanently protected um, into a different zoning classification, it's just a signaling from um, the zoning map perspective that these parcels are protected. They're not really, it, they shouldn't be classified under a residential zone because they're not intended for residential development. Um, so the purpose mm -hmm. statement would be to um, be modified to preserve um, the farms, forests, river corridors, ecological habitat, and recreational lands, and to be comprised of protected open space, which is either rural publicly owned open space and greenways, lands that are permanently protected with conservation or agricultural restrictions, and urban parks, including those for organized recreational uses. Um, the uses in the FFR would also be modified to allow some uh, percentage of the property to be developed for roads, um, drainage, or other um, necessary improvements. Um, so that, um, it, but improvements that are meant to protect the resource area um, as opposed to just development improvements. Um, and then also allow through site plan approval, um, more than a 25% development um, of a property when it's created to enhance or expand the function of the park or recreational facility. Um, and the, the goal of course is to minimize the impacts to the resource areas through that um, construction or modification of the property. And then, um, and 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 um, also include um, other uses under this umbrella. So um, passive and active recreation um, and buildings that support those uses, um, agricultural and accessory structures and farm stands and land, land conservation and restoration. So the idea is to ensure that we're not limiting um, the kinds of activities that really um, sometimes are necessary to um, um, over undertake to um, preserve the areas, but um, make sure that it's just limited to the, those um, 
um, that are necessary. And then finally, um, allow flexibility for events or other um, activities that help fund or support the viability and the long-term care and maintenance of these properties. So um, this in particular relates to places like Look Park or Child's Park, that they could have weddings or special functions there because that's part of how they can, these private parks in particular, how they can fund the maintenance and overall um, viability of these spaces. Um, and then the rest of this is, the, is a deletion of the existing text related to transfer development rights since it um, really has never been used in the city and we don't anticipate that it would ever be used. Um, and then finally, I'll just show you on the map, um, next page, and I have a, um, let me zoom out a little bit here. Um, so the grade areas um, show um, the areas that are proposed to be brought in. This is a little bit hard to read, but the gray, the black outlined areas are already areas that are zoned farms, forests, and rivers. So they would go to farms, forests, and recreation. So this area where my little hand is, is Fitzgerald Lake. Um, there's Sawmill Hills over here. There's some other holdings that sort of are part of the conservation area that um, is sort of is linked into um, Fitzgerald Lake. And then we've got um, um, uh, other areas that are proposed to be brought in that are privately protected or under conservation restrictions, either because they're, for example, here's Emerson Way. Um, there's a lot of conservation area that was permanently protected for that, um, around that subdivision, that land would come in the same as the um, permanently protected conservation area that's still in private ownership around the ice pond subdivision. So there's several areas like that that are also part of this. And I'll, um, mentioned that notice went out to all the property owners. So there are 118 bits in this map. So every property owner was um, notified. Although I have to say a handful of those were the city. So um, um, we had already sort of worked with recreation department about this and um, also had talked to folks at Look Park as well as Child's Park about this uh, proposed amendment. So that's that one. So um, just in terms of process, Carolyn, so we'll probably, there's three things that we're looking at today, three proposed amendments. We'll take them one at a time. And we're vote, and I guess we're voting to make a recommendation to city council that the planning board supports these amendments, correct? Um, yes, yeah. so there's, um, well, this first, the first one in front of you is really sort of our two amendments related to farms, forests, and rivers. And then the next one that we'll get into after this conversation um, is in another section of zoning. But these um, will then go to city council after a recommendation from the planning board. They'll go to city council subcommittee, which is legislative matters. I don't know if in particular this one, um, the um, that other committee, um, um, community resources may also want to look at. It. I can't remember how they voted last night, um, but at any rate, legislative matters makes um, a formal amendment to the full city council as well. So both of those merge together. Those are two public hearing processes. Sometimes you all have a joint public hearing with legislative matters. It just didn't work out this time this way for this one. Um, and then once those two recommendations are uh, made, it goes to full council for votes and they have to vote two consecutive meetings um, on zoning amendments. So, okay, on this first one around the uh, farms, forests and recreation. Are there any clarifying questions from the board members before we move to public comments? I just want to uh, check and make sure you got the sign up. Correct. I did. Yeah, um, I have a couple. So proper, what are property owners 
rights here? I, I assume there's different conservation restrictions. They're not all the same. So now it's all kind of blanketed under this. You know, they're getting pulled into the zoning. So do they have any rights to say, I don't want my property zoned this way? Um, so certainly anyone can object to zoning. Uh, the city council, it's a legislative action. Um, so city council can consider those. Um, I, but it's, there's no change. This is not a change to management or to anything that specifically is already on record under a conservation restriction or agricultural preservation restriction. Those are the governing documents for how that land can be used specifically. The zoning is really just sort of, is really the city's um, regulatory guide about what you could do if there weren't any other layers of restrictions on a property. So in fact, the zoning isn't really going to change what's already recorded at the Registry of Deeds about what's allowed on these parcels. Um, but what it does is it's sort of truth in advertising. It says if someone takes the map of the city and sees these big swaths of residentially zoned property, they think, oh, wow, this is where I'm going to go put my solar farm. This is where I'm going to go build a 25 lot subdivision. But it's not until they dive deeper and they get to that parcel and they say, oh, there's a conservation restriction on this property. Never mind. I can't do anything. So it's really just sort of a signaling to say, these are all protected lands. And this other area, this is where you can do residential development. Or and then how so how often as we have more properties come under conservation how often does this map get amended you look at it every year and put more prop you know it, it just kind of smacks of like spot zoning to me why are, why are we just sticking these little spots all over the place and looking at the current yeah. map i mean it's already been done so you know some of them are contiguous with other areas but right it just uh yeah, so it's not spot zoning if there's a plan um, behind the the, rash, the rationale for it. So if in our resilience and regeneration plan, we say we want to permanently protect these lands, the zoning is not, it, uh, and so we have a map of that. And we say these are the important resource areas. Um, by zoning those, is, um, because we have the plan that says this is how we're going to address these, that's not considered spot zoning, um, even though it looks like they're blobs in different parts of the city. Um, the um, again, it's not so. And then yes, we've been uh, when we've uh, we've acquired um, you know um, I don't know 100 maybe 200 acres of land a year. So yes, at the end of each year, we'd say okay. We've got this this land. We're going to bring it into um, this zone, and just basically making the zoning map match what's really allowed in the uh, on the underlying piece of property. And is that this process? It, it goes to city council, and they ask for a recommendation every year to bring in another hundred acres every year. So far, that's what it's been either a year, a year and a half. But we. When we were doing it with city owned properties, we we're waiting till we had sort of a batch. So it wasn't just one parcel at a time, but it, we had enough to say, okay, this makes sense. Let's do these, you know, 35 acres um, and then wait till the next year or two years down the road and do another batch. Any other questions from the board members? So, Carolyn, I have one. I just want to project down the road a little bit. Um, the city just recently purchased the old uh, Pine Grove um, golf course. So it's a new, large, active and passive recreation area. So theoretically, then, a lot of this would apply to that, especially the piece that talks about upgrades and enhancements around drainage. Mm -hmm. And then around structure, <clears throat> and unless it hits a 25% of the land, um, the open space being altered, uh, it doesn't come to the planning board for any kind of site review unless it goes beyond 25%. So who does 
kind of watch the city, so to speak, when it comes to putting buildings on that land or altering the land in some fashion? How does that work? Um, well, so the concert, so for, for a place like Pine Grove, there's a plan that um, the Conservation Commission that's, that's um, developed in concert with the Conservation Commission, and it has to meet the goals of um, that, that property, in essence. I mean, the, this, um, the city is bound and sometimes by the funding source uh, on as to what it can and cannot do. So I think there are several checks <laughs> in terms of what can be accomplished. Um, and of course, um, it's a fishbowl. So I don't think the city could get away with <laughs> anything without anybody knowing <laughs> what's happening. But it's really also tied into that conservation or that open space plan. I mean, we have that sort of governing document to say, okay, we need to provide, you know, accessible trails for people on, on new parks that we're, we need to provide accessible parking. Um, so all of those kinds of things fall into that category. Okay, good. I was thinking by the uh, example of a caretaker's house on any mm -hmm. of these lands. The only place I'm aware of that is Arcadia. And East Hampton has a caretaker's home for their property manager, I think. I think they still use it. Um, so we're just kind of adding these things into the ordinance in case something comes up down the road, correct? Yeah, although I think it's not going to be so much for publicly owned land. It's really probably going to be for private land. So Look Park used to have a house that the manager for Look Park used to use as well. And I don't know, is if Child's Park feels like someday they might want to have a caretaker on site to make sure that, that that management goes more smoothly or they're taking a different direction. So I think it's really going to be more on the privately owned or non, you know, private nonprofit um, land as opposed to city land. Thank you. Anything else before we turn it over to the public? All right. So is there anyone who would like to speak in favor or opposed to the zoning amendment that we've seen the, the discussion tonight? Please raise your hand electronically by using the reactions toolbar. Or just wave your hand on the camera. Nobody has a reaction. Okay. All right. So, and again, this is just comment about our first one, um, <clears throat> the forest farms, farm forest recreation. I like that you kept the same uh, hey. acronym, Carolyn, FFR to FFR. I have, a, I have a question. Could you identify yourself? Yes, I'm, my name is Craig Anderson. Um, I own um, property between the Garson Fields property and Chesterfield Road in um, Northampton. We had um, emailed Caroline earlier today about a question. It's a, um, it's a privately owned property, but they have conservation restrictions. We are under the Marble Brook um, conservation restrictions. And I just want to have reiterated that this isn't going to change anything to our previous agreement with them. Um, we've had some issues with they want to build a bike path going through our property because they have a, they say they have a supposed um, right of way through it, and we're just feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Thank you, um, Carolyn. Um, I guess they just want clarification. Who's they that you're referring to? Um, My name is Craig Anderson, and the Guyettes. We you would we had talked about an email today. Right. No, I don't mean that. I mean, thank you. Um, I mean, um, who you said they want to put a bike path through. Who is they? The town does. There's supposed to be a, a bike path around the whole town going through yep. a lot of different properties. Yep. So this Tra zoning. Is it trail, 
Oh, trail one was the. Yeah. yeah. North yep. one. I mean, yes, we're still looking at um, options for Northampton one. This zoning has nothing to do with whether or not we pursue access points uh, along publicly, um, you know, conservation restricted land that has a public purpose. Um, so this is neutral uh, as it relates to that. It's not going to, you know, sway one way or the other. So, Carolyn, let me just ask. So, in terms of privately held land by this fellow up in Leeds, if the city saw a good place for an access point and a trail near in on his property, he would still have to grant his their permission for that. Yeah, I don't know the terms of the conservation restriction that's on the the unique <laughs> term because each of these has a different way that it's develop. So I can't really speak to that, but it has nothing to do whether the zoning passes or not. So if the city wanted to, um, you know, request a trail be constructed, it really depends on whether that allowance is already there in the uh, in the recorded document. Um, and if not, then, you know, there could be a negotiation about that. But that is a completely separate conversation um, that's outside and different from this zoning. Thank you. Thank you very much for your clarification. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the public? Comments? Okay, all right. Hearing none, we'll go back to the board. Any questions about the text? Does anyone want to move a comma or change the wording? I, I did see a couple um, numbers and letters that were out of place. I don't know if, I mean, if you want that level of detail, Carolyn, or not. Um, you mean like the formatting, the bulleting, and those kind of numbers? Yeah, like um, there were two E's. There was a four that didn't oh, match yeah. anything. So that's fine to give me the heads up. But I would not go into that level of detail because once this happens, we just shoot it off to the E code people and they have a whole different, you know, they may plug it into their system and it changes. Okay. So, thanks. All right then. Hearing none, maybe we'll we'll move uh, to have a motion to recommend this one zoning amendment on 350-17 farm forest and rivers. Uh, I would move to recommend this uh, this zoning amendment. Thank you. Second. Second by David. Okay. And we'll keep the public uh, comment period open until we finish all of them. So the motion to made and seconded to <clears throat> recommend this forward. Um, any discussion? All right, well, let's go through that roll call and this time I'll go with Melissa first. Yes. And David? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Sam? Thank you. And Jana? Yes. And Marika? Yes. And the chair votes yes also. So that's unanimous, okay. We'll move down to the second one, Carolyn, which is about a map change. The while she's finding her document. So uh, this is a map change to 350, 3.4 to rezone 117 publicly owned lands or permanently protected open space parcels to the forest farms and recreation zone. Yeah, so that's just the corresponding map that goes with the text. Um, we'd have to, it's a separate section of zoning. So we need a, a, um, a motion to recommend that piece as well. Okay. Caleb, this is where we get very bureaucratic. You pay close attention now, okay? Um, any discussion on this little, on this approval, this motion, this uh, ordinance? 
Is there a motion? So I'll move that we um, recommend the map change 353.4 to rezone the 117 publicly owned lands to farms, forest, and recreation zone. Thank you. Second. I second. Thank you, Jenna. Any discussion? Um, I'll probably abs abstain from this vote because I have no way of uh, double checking that all 135 parcels on that little map are what, you know, we say they are. I don't, uh, I, 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 well, none of us do if, if, if that were a basis to, I mean, you certainly can abstain if you, if you feel you must, but, but none of us can go through and, and, uh, and, and check all those parcels. Uh, if there is a, I mean, it seems to me that if somebody has a, if something is lumped in, that's not supposed to by this, this change, and it doesn't happen until the city council does it, right? We're just recommending the, the change, right? Carolyn? Correct. And it's, um, uh, the other piece is that it's really about taking all the conservation restricted parcels that are not also in the floodplain and transferring them to this farms, forest and river. So even if a fleck was off here or there on the map, it really boils down to the text description as well. So we're gonna be pulling those parcels that have those permanent restrictions over and, and, um, and recreation parcels. And so does a map change like this have a key index? that list all of these parcels, 117 or 135? Yes, so I mean, I could have um, sent you out the Excel spreadsheet that goes with it, that has the parcels um, and I'd be you know, happy to send it to you now as well. But um, uh, that's sort of, that's how we did, generate the mailing because we have the map ID, we have the owner. Um, I will also say though, that there are portions of the properties that are on that list that are would be going into this zoning classification because there are lots in which there may be a house on a portion of the property, but the conservation restriction is only on the back half. So you'll see the entire parcel, the entire parcel is not shown on this map. But when you see the line item for the property owner and the property owner's name, it's going to say 75 acres, but really only, you know, eight, um, 70 acres are going to be moved into the FFR because the other acreage is for the house or something like that. Okay, good. And uh, the mailing went out to all of these homeowners, and I assume that's how our friend from Leeds. Um, was notified of these changes and he raised that question. Chris, does that help at all or you still want to kind of move along with your abstention? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it'll pass without me. Why don't you uh, call on me last and see how it goes? All right. <laughs> okay, so the motion's been made and seconded and we had a little brief discussion on it. Um, so we'll move to a roll vote. Um, Melissa. Yes. And David? Okay, yes. And uh, Sam Taylor? Sam appears to be, oh, he's not frozen. You're muted. Sam, on this motion, do you want to vote to approve or deny? Uh, Sam, you're muted. All right, maybe we'll have Sam at game two. Um, Sam, are you with us? Yes, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, I had a tenant call me. Put locked okay. out of their house. Uh, yes. All right. So you approve this map change uh, amendment? Yes. Okay. And Jana? Yes. Yes. Great. And Jana? Okay, and Marissa? Yes. And the chair also votes yes. And uh, Chris? 
I'll abstain. Very good. Thank you. So I think that was six in favor and one abstention. Okay, great. So now we're down to our third amendment, which is to amend 350-89 to establish standards for including electric vehicle charging stations and conduit in parking lots. So can you see my screen again? No. Um, it's just adding two paragraphs to the site plan, the parking, actually it's a section in the zoning that addresses sort of parking lot layouts. Carolyn, um, hold, hold on, Carolyn. No, all we see is a little word, the menu bar for your word application. Okay. Unless somebody else sees something, I don't. Okay, uh, put the wrong thing up. Okay, how about this one? Can you see 8.9, 350.8.9, 8.9? Okay. Yes. So this section is um, 8.9 deals with uh, parking lot layout standards um, in the zoning. And so this is a proposal to add two paragraphs um, to the end of this section that would require um, in parking lots either if you're expanding a parking lot or building new um, where you're adding 25 or more spaces you need one electrical vehicle charging port per 25 parking spaces installed the second paragraph would be to say state that for new parking lots creating 25 or more spaces um, so not if you're expanding but just brand new that you also have to put um, conduit um, to support charging um, stations at a ratio of one per 15 parking spaces to be installed. Okay, great. Um, questions from the board? How did you come up with these numbers? I mean, this seems so specific and random. Um, uh, because in the zoning, we have other thresholds that start at 25 parking spaces. So instead of sort of creating a new threshold, we thought we'd use the same threshold that's used for the number of trees and the number of, you know, islands you have, or at a certain point, you have to add islands to the interior of a parking lot. So it's, it matches You're in that this other threshold. category of parking. Yeah. Areas. And the 15 yeah. also, or is the 15... The 15, um, the, no, I guess I'm wondering, where did you come up with like one per 25 and one per 15? Like, how do you determine that that's the right number? Um, like, it's like well, our glorious future where one out of every 15 cars is electric. Yeah. Like, who cares? Like, why, why are we doing that? Um, it's really because we have other things at those thresholds. It's not, there's no magic to that. Um, but we thought instead of, instead of create, instead of trying to figure out some or analyze what might happen in Northampton or what that number would be, that because we can, we know that other things are triggered at that point that we would just tie that onto it. No, but my question it, is like, why don't we just say for new parking lots that are above 25, you have to put conduit for every spot to have a charging station. Like, how did you come up with one out of every oh. 15 spots? Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, why one out of every 15? Well, because we're going to get a new parking spaces before your before we'll have everyone owning an electric car is my guess. So um, I think that. Um, I think we didn't want to, you know, assume that every space had to be addressed because it's going to take a long time to transition. Uh -huh. It sounds like you made up a number. <laughs> like 15 just seems so yeah. random to me. Yeah, like it is. It is partially made up. I, we, you know, we have no yeah. <laughs> qualms about saying that, but again, yeah. just sort of using the number we had. And hmm. I, I wonder if another way to approach it is through a percentage because I see where uh, uh, a developer, uh, an applicant might put in 23 spaces, new ones at 24, just so he, they don't have to put in conduit. But what if we said 10% um, 
of any new spaces need to have um, the capacity for <clears throat> a charging station. You know, when I go through these public hearings, I think of projects that we've, we've talked about and discussed here, and I'm thinking of the large <clears throat> uh, parking lot project behind City Hall. I don't remember the amount of spaces they added there. They reconfigured the lot. Um, but that would have been a perfect place for it. And I know there are some other constraints for putting conduit underneath all of that um, land. But I wondered if to get at David's little question, if we went to a percentage, if that would be more equal across the board. So, uh, honestly, to me, it's not really an equity issue. I'm just wondering, like, the logic of predicting, like, our electric charging needs. <laughs> like, who has good information on that? I will say one out of 15 well, yeah. is a percentage. <laughs> yeah, it is. A, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also interested, uh, you know, as you said about the, the parking lot, there there was a, I don't remember what the constraints were. And I know, and I remember they put some conduit in. But what what room do we want to leave for? I mean, I'm glad that they did something there. I wouldn't want um, them not to be able to fix that parking lot because there's a, a, a conduit constraint. I mean, that one in particular, I can, um, you may recall that there is significant amount of contamination underground and they yeah. were restricted to how much disturbance they could um, do underground to do the conduit. So that was the factor for that parking lot. But this this was also actually this that was part of the generation for the conversation to just go ahead and move forward with the zoning change about this. So we had a standard. So um, uh, but again, there's no magic to the 15 to 25 um, at all. We did not do any analysis for how much our demand would be. And I don't know where you would start with that, like you said, David. I mean, do we have any sense for like of the charging stations that we have in the city now? Like how often are they used? Anything like that? Very hard um, to get a free one and open one. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I know the ones downtown um, are used regularly, but you know, there are a few out on King Street um, that I don't know. That I don't have the for which I do not have the data, it was just anecdotal information, which means nothing, so. Marissa, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. So one is this, if any of the uh, uh, builder types, engineer types, who knows? It seems to me that like, if you, yeah, am I correct to think that I, that running the conduits in there to the extent that they go to, you know, one particular spot or whatever, but the the way they're run through underground would also mean there'd be future expansion a po possible um, if greater needs happen, right? Like the conduit is the big thing. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm thinking of it like, you know, wiring in a house, like you run wiring through and then you have a, if you want another outlet in a, in a room, you, if the wiring's already through there, is that what, is that how the conduit kind of works? I don't, I don't know the science. The conduit's just an empty sleeve, and then they run the wiring when they put the actual chargers in at some point in the future. But I mean, I that's the idea, have, right? You don't want to all the concrete. electric vehicle chargers I've installed. There's dedicated conduit from the one charging station back to the transformer, so you can't run like multiple charging stations through the same piece of conduit. So you can kind of like make the space for for it to run later uh but um but the actual but the actual charging station it only is going to get wired up when it when it uh when you actually put in the charging station right it's, so this way you don't have to dig up the curbing and and the asphalt right. and everything that's in place it's just it's there it's it's really easy to throw conduit in the ground when you're doing all that work it's a lot harder to go back later and and dig it out and fix all that stuff right. Especially because it's very okay. close to the curve. Is the 15 in share. addition to the 25? 
the one per 15 for conduit is in addition to the one per 25 of actual chargers. Yeah. Okay. But and it's only for new. So uh, so the other one is also for expanded parking. Right. Yeah. And can we look um, at the text again, Carolyn? Because I just I am a little. It seems a little clunky to me. Okay. Yep. My other big comment is it says you know one charging port per twenty five, and I'm I'm worried is that specific enough language? I mean, usually all of these uh, vehicle charging stations have two ports. So is that what you mean? Two parking, you know, one parking space? Because almost every one of them has, they put it in between two spaces and there's two, two. ports that serve two spaces. Yeah. Um, right, so that's, so if you had, so you'd need to, um, I mean, right. So if you just had 25 parking spaces, what you're saying is you'll end up with two, no matter right, what, because the system fine. comes up, right. That's how the system but, comes. So, yeah. So, um, but then if you had 50 spaces, you would just still need one still station. Have the one. It would have two. Yeah. So it would, it would be two spaces, mm -hmm. but one station. Right. So for 50 spaces, you'd need two ports and three conduit ready ports three spaces with conduit but no ports what if so under that situation can you count if you actually provide a port can you count that as one of the ones you should have done conduit for right like because they come in twos <laughs> right you know what when this this kind of project automatically goes to the planning board so you'll get to decide when it comes whether it's satisfactory <laughs> I have a question or maybe more of a comment. I mean, I had a similar questions that other people have raised about kind of why these numbers and also just trying to understand the technology a little bit more, but it seems a little bit surprising to me given other parts of our zoning that are asking us to kind of, I see kind of pushing more aggressively toward a, a different kind of future for the city in terms of energy use. So the fact that, you know, these accessory dwelling units can't use fossil fuels, for example, the fact that, you know, new residential homes have to be solar ready and so forth. And that this, that's kind of the standard across the board that here we're setting a very different kind of precedent. Well, maybe once in a while it will happen and we're just gonna sort of pick this arbitrary number that a, a few people are gonna have these. So. I, I, I don't know exactly where to go with that, but it just does seem like this is a very different um, kind of standard than where we're setting elsewhere. And I, so I, I guess one, one question would be, what does the conduit equivalent of solar ready look like? And is it actually feasible to expect of people building parking lots? Um, well, I, I guess I look at it a little bit in a maybe a different way in that um, these are these are commercial projects that are probably, you know, on the medium to big size if they're building parking lots of this, of this scale, at least for North, for Northampton. Um, and they're probably then for people who um, there are going to be in and out. And so we may not need to have the same kind of um, constant infrastructure at every single parking lot throughout the entire city um, versus, you know, this other where you're, you may, the, um, you know, we're asking about the residential and fossil fuel um, housing and buildings. And so a couple of things, well, I mean, yes, our biggest load is through transportation and buildings, but um, I think buildings are a much bigger, a much greater concern at this point that we need to push further. And um, parking lots, you know, the one, I guess, we're not trying to encourage new parking lots, but if they're going to happen, then they should accommodate electrical vehicles, but it's not gonna be a 24 seven usage kind of thing where you know, cars are there for a long time. I don't know if that answers your question, but I sort of look at them differently in that um, 
they're not, um, they're, these are sort of high turnover places. And, um, and we also don't know how much demand people will need as they go out when they're coming from their origin that might have, they might have fully charged up. They're going to a place for an hour or whatever. Um, the demand just might be different. I mean, I kind of, if I, um, oh, sorry. Let's start, um, with, let's start with Marissa and then we'll go back to Chris. Okay. Um, well, and kind of to build on what uh, Jenna was saying, I, I mean, well, the thing that I wonder about, I mean, if we achieved, and I, I think eventually we will, like 100% electric, uh, you know, car, like that's where where the future we hope is going, right? Um, to the extent that have cars, I mean, it's really not clear to me. I mean, it's certainly not the case that every parking lot, certainly not every parking spot, and even beyond that, every parking lot needs it or it's conducive to, like the the convenience store, I mean, not that they would have 25 parking um, spots, but I don't know. I mean, like I'm, I'm, I, I I'm, I'd be really interested to see more data. And that kind of leads to the second question that I had. Um, and this is just for informational purposes um, for me. I like, so when, when these um, charging um, places put in, do, are there like private companies that make like run the software that plugs them in and they make money off of them does the developer or the the property owner make money back from them are they feeding like um the the concept i get like you know but um i'm also really interested in sort of how what what this means in terms of what a what we're asking for developers and and also pivot away from big oil and gas um in terms of like gas stations in town and uh and you know what it means for the city getting ahead of um, other, uh, you know, there's going to be some inevitable pivots made by you know kind of old oil and gas business. Do, would this? I mean, it seems to me it might shift, you know, to some degree the benefits of renewable and spread them out more across um, a, a larger variety of players, I guess, and stakeholders, but. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know if anybody's any thoughts about that. Chris, do you have a little background on the uh, the installation and the support of those charging stations? Yeah, so, you know, there are proprietary um, companies, ChargePoint is one, uh, and they, they can manage, you, you can get an app on your phone or kind of like a credit card you keep in your wallet. Um, it does kind of authenticate you as a user and unlocks the port so you can plug it into your car and then keeps track of how much uh, electricity you use. And then the, the owner, the property owner can choose to charge you zero cents per kilowatt hour or up to whatever they want to charge you for it. Um, so that's all just kind of built into that charging port. So there, there are a bunch of different systems that are similar. So it kind of manages the the whole um, the whole transaction through an app on your phone. Um, so, like most of the ones in Northampton are free, for example. But I'm sure at some point they they could charge. Maybe they could charge just to recoup their electricity expenses, or you know maybe they charge more. Or it could even be used as kind of a metering system, right? Like if you park here for for more than an hour, then we charge you sort of thing. You can do it any any different way. Um, I was trying to look up very quickly if there are any kind of, uh, you know, other organizations that are thinking about parking lot uh, percentages. I saw LEED has uh, 5%, for example. So it'd be one out of every 20 spaces. So So we appear to be asking for more capability than that in the future. Um, I would argue the way that this is written that as a planning board, we should kind of take the current one, you know, take what they owe us in the beginning and ask for the additional in addition. Can so say that again, if, Chris? well, you know, I'm just trying to say, so say you have a, a, a 50, 
a lot with 50 spaces, then I would interpret that as, as give us, it's really just one charging station with two ports. So we get two EV spaces. Should, I mean, should we define it more as like EV spaces than EV ports? Like, I just feel like it gets confusing. Talk about the number of vehicles, not the number of, of yeah. Talk about charging the number of stations that right? can be charged. Yeah, yeah. maybe. I, I agree with that. Number of, uh, I guess it's a shot in the dark with like the future of electrification and all that stuff, and we got to do something, I suppose. So you know, twenty five seems as good a number as any. I worry about this fifteen for conduit because it sounds like, oh, we're doing a good thing. We're like putting it, we're making them put in the conduit for like an additional, I don't know what it is, 10%, uh, you know, 8% of the spot of the spots to have. But what that does is it puts a lot of pressure in the future if Northampton wants to change the rules to create more charging stations and new parking lots. It creates a whole lot of pressure for us to go to 15, one for 15 and nothing else. Cause we, we, we've just told all these people to put in the conduit to put in one per 15. So if we say actually 10, per, you know, 10% of your spots need charging stations, they're gonna say, wait a second, you put told us to put on all this conduit, you know, why? So I don't quite see what the conduit gets us. I just think it's, I mean, I understand it's a little cheaper to like, it's cheaper to do it now while you're pouring the thing than later, but it's such a minor thing. I just think it's kind of silly. And like, at what point are we going to turn around and say, all you people who put the one for 15 now go put the things in? Cause it's just going to be like this select group of like a few parking lots. I don't know. I don't understand how that works in the future. Maybe, maybe we're helping them. We're saving, we're helping them future proof for themselves. Maybe they'll want to put them in and they'll be glad that we made them put the car. Maybe, I mean, it's not like we have a, like a department in Northampton that decides like, here's how many gas stations we need in Northampton. Like the point of like making this a for-profit industry is that like, then we have an industry who like wants to make it successful. And, you know, it's not all just like people making up numbers, you know? Um, There's a lot of embodied carbon when you're ripping out all this infrastructure to put in conduit that we could have made them put in before. Well, let me just clarify there would if if we did in the future change to say we want, you know, one per 15 or one per 10 um, spaces. That's not going to affect the people who've already put their conduit in um, unless they're coming and rebuilding a new parking lot. And why are we so asking them to put the conduit in? If we can't ever uh, ask them to put a port in, then who cares if they have conduit? Because we think the demand will be there and it'll, they'll be ready to go and just pop them in place. But we're not going to come, you know, after we can't, if we change the standard in zoning, then the uh, uh, property owners that have built under the previous zoning, they don't have to then come up to code, right? They just have what they have and then they can, they can put in an, to the um, capacity that they've um, built in. Well, I mean, I, I can see a situation. Right. Uh, we're, never, we're never gonna be able to tell them to put in more ports after the fact, unless there's a project before right. us. But yeah, I don't think- I think they'll I don't be think happy the, that, we, that we made them put in the conduit. They might, you know, maybe we have more foresight than as a city than they do as a developer. I mean, I can see a potential advantage to putting the condo in it is if the demand goes up um, and conduit is already already there for pe for for property owners and and entities to be able to tap into it because the 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 demand is there and they're set up to do it. It'll it'll disincentivize the sort of uh, speculator coming in at that time and and digging up to make more. So the the Chris the the trade off and you know you know what I mean like it it won't be pro it won't be as profitable no. um, for people to come come in and and dig up to put that stuff to meet that demand if other people can more easily meet the demand with conduit that's already there. No, I mean it, it seems the, speculative to me, but I mean the, the 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 profits that you would have to be making off of charging stations would have to be so much higher to make it worth like oh I have 
a hundred foot of PVC in the ground. I can't let it go to waste. It's not that much money. Like it's not a big deal. So like if the economics, it's so profitable to that I have to max out my use of PVC that I have in the ground, like it's going to be worth it to rip up your parking car like lot. It's not like this one per 15 is, is basically just, it's just, we're just putting plastic in the ground for no reason, I think. <laughs> you know? No, I, uh... Conduit's cheap, you know. It, I, this feels more like a gesture to me. It feels like um, requiring all new houses to be, you know, solar ready, um, to have no fossil fuels. Like as a city, if we're going to meet our goals of being net zero by 2030, is it, it? You know, we have to make these gestures. We have to make these movements, and nobody can know what the demand's going to be down the road but we're saying by this that we expect that it's going to increase right now we want you to put in one for 20 or one for 25 and we want you to throw in conduit for uh, one for 15. Um, our intention is that the, the the usage is the demand is going to increase so it, it feels like a gesture to me and the numbers are more irrelevant than the um, than the, the gesture. I, I also I think we need to plan conduit for uh, not just not conduit, cheap. but the uh, the future, you know, they might need extra transformers or something to, you know, use all this conduit. So we would have to ask on site plans that they're identifying at least enough space for the infrastructure that it takes to run these chargers, not just right. have conduit in the ground, but pads also, for the ports. Yeah. You know, you a space for the for, ports at the spaces too, right? No, I mean, we don't have to go that far necessarily. Yeah, but I think that, we that's easier to add in line. later. I, I think, yeah, because you don't know what what charging ports you're going to use or what pad right. you need. So you can you can always dig that in later, but I think you need to provide the, you know, on the site plan, like a where's your snow storage? Where is your future electric transformer? You know, where is this conduit going to, right? <laughs> Well, no presumably way. they have to put in ports for the one per 25. So they have something. Right. So they have to upsize, like in the future, they're going to have plans to upsize the transformer. That's my question. Right. I don't know. I agree with Melissa. This is a gesture. So I would vote against it. Like, why are we doing gestures? This seems silly. Well, and also like to push back, conduit's not that cheap. You know, it's not like, I mean, one piece of conduit is $15 and goes 10 feet. That's many, many pieces. And then we're talking about, and then when you get into like three inch conduit, it's really expensive, so. But in the, yeah. in the overall I, cost of the project, it's a very, very small percentage of cost. Okay, I'm just, I'm just saying like, you know, we, we throw out like, spending other people's money is really easy to do. And I'm just not saying it's, I'm not saying to not do it. I'm just saying the price is more expensive than you. Then we're, then we're just saying it is. It's not free. All right. May I suggest a little uh, time out from our discussion for a minute to see if there's anyone in the public who would like to comment on the uh, proposed ordinance. Mr. Hansel, who's here every week, and Connor, any information you want to add? Okay. Hearing none. Kelly, could you bring the text back up for us? Um, I, I, I'd just like to suggest, uh, again, go back to that language, that the language in A is just, the definition kind of is the same as in B. I would be in favor of, of requiring one per 15 now and just be done with it. That seems to make more sense rather than just asking people to put construction materials into the ground because it makes us feel good. I mean, the cost of one per 15 and the cost for one per 25 is nominal in the course of a project, honestly. Like one of these ports costs what, $5,000? So what are you suggesting, David, that we delete J and we just change the language in I? I personally would vote for that. I mean, I, would, I don't know if 25 or 15 or whatever, I don't really have any insight, honestly, but I'm fine if, if people, I mean, I would prefer to just like make it clear. Here's what you have to do. 
I don't think we know like in the future, people are gonna want more hand towels. So you better put blocking for more hand towels in your bathrooms, you know, <laughs> talk to you later, you know? I don't know. It's just, I don't think we know that 15 is any more magical a number than 25. So I would just like, let's pick a number and just make them do it. Um, so you're saying, I, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, just briefly, I, I agree with that, David. I mean, I think, you know, do or do not, uh, the uh, sort of projecting into the future um, seems, well, speculative to me. Um, the other thing is, is I'd really like to clean up the language and I, I mean, this whole discussion of ports versus stations versus spaces, um, we, we should define what we're talking about. Sorry to be a lawyer about it, but we should define what we're talking about and make it clear in there. If, if, if ports mean like plug into, you know, each one car or if port means charging station with two plugs, um, which is probably not the right word, but um, whatever it is, uh, it, I would like to see that clarified. Because I will say after the discussion that Chris and David just had, I'm not sure if we're talking about uh, space for 20, for 50 cars to, to charge or 25 cars to charge. It's, it's a little unclear to me. So can I just ask for clarification about um, David, what you're suggesting? Um, just um, cut to just one additional change that would say for new or expanded parking lots that result in 15 um, or well, more I would say, spaces. I would still say, no, I would still say the provision of 25 or more spaces because you said that kicks people up into other categories for other things. Okay. And to say, if you have 25 or more spaces, you have to put one charging port per 15 spaces should be installed. And then drop J. Those two numbers don't have to be the same, right? That's one's the threshold and one's the, right. the right. ratio. Right. And, and then drop J, you're saying. That's what I would do. I, mean, I don't know what okay. other people think, but yes, I would, I would rather do that. Yeah, I think that makes it more clear for the applicant than for this planning board member. So for something like this, do we have to like do a, like a motion to amend this or do we just mark it up and and then vote on on what that or? Yeah, I mean, you would um, make uh, you you would vote on moving this with a positive recommendation with the edits. And then it would go to city council. So in this case, it would go to legislative matters with your proposed change to delete J and just change I to um, uh, one charging port. And you have to decide whether you want per 15 parking spaces or if you just want if, if it's um, if you want to change that language too, do we, do we have any data on like over the past two years? Say like how many parking lots of what sizes have have been approved or or applied for? I mean, I don't I don't even have a sense for the scale of any of this, honestly. Um. Well, as, as an example, not too long ago, we approved uh, a, a large change to the parking lot at the Catholic Church on King Street. If folks remember that, there was some reconstruction remodeling. I forget, I think they added approximately more than 25 spaces. So they would have probably kicked into the threshold. They might have also argued, as, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, that come on, our parishioners are never here more than 50 minutes. They run in late to mass and they run out early. They're not going to charge their cars. Why do we have to do that? <laughs> but I, I don't think we're looking at the uses of the parking lot. We're saying basically any parking lot for any use is to have this applied to. Yeah, I mean, you had the Starbucks um, lot, the new drive-through on King Street that um, that hasn't finished being built out so you're not you know you're not seeing the extent of that yet but that's um a new lot and then of course the um the roundhouse lot um is completely being rebuilt um and how many and, how many for, for instance how many do we have i mean we just approved that a few months ago right like how many spots were yeah. in it and how many ports were in it i mean do we have those numbers 
Um, I can pull it up. I, I will say, so if you're trying to get a point in lead for green vehicles, the requirements are 5% uh, of all parking spaces for green vehicles only, and another 2% are alternative fueling station, which again could be electric ports. So that's 7% is essentially how you get a lead point. And one, one out of 15 is 6.67%. So we're very close those, to what, what lead says. But those green vehicle parking spaces don't have to have charging. They're just green vehicle parking spots in lead. They're just they're just signs saying you can only park here if you have a green vehicle. They're not actually charging spaces. Oh, so the two percent are the charging. It's just two percent, yeah. Well, and is that total or new? I mean, is that sort of that's what your standard should be for new development, or that's how many in the city? Because if it's that's how many should be in the city, then arguably we should be setting the threshold above that to try to make up a deficit for all of the other parking lots and spaces that don't have any ports. If we're, I mean, if we're gonna get at that level. Of detail. Yeah, I don't know how to pick that number. <laughs> That's a number I can't tell you. Well, I'm more asking what's this like the lead standard that you are reading is that is the standard that it should be 5% or 2% or whatever it is of your total spots or 5% or 2% right. of, of new building. Of a new Who's project. Not? It's up a new project? Yeah, because they're only concerned about each individual project that you're trying to get lead certification for. Okay. Do we do we have any 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 do we just say it has to be an electric charging port? Do we don't have any specs on like it has to be this many amps, this this fast of a charger? They can just give you like Right. Like a half an amp every hour and that's enough? Like, do we have anything on that? Yeah, we talked about that internally and um, uh -huh. just decided that it's, um, I think it was too fine a point to, to regulate it at this stage. Because uh -huh. that seems to be, I mean, I don't have an electric vehicle, but that seems like that would be a high, a big incentive if you have a fast charging port and you can actually charge your vehicle in the hour that you're in a place versus some old slow technology. But again, it's moving quickly. I don't really know. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. Te technology changes. So you wouldn't want to write something in that is obsolete in a year. Thanks so much. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of back in the late 80s um, when it said de deregulation of telephones, all of a sudden you're a private person could put in a telephone box, a public payphone. And people were doing that left and right and making good money out of it. And that lasted for two or three years. And then cell phones became popular. And all those people lost that cash cow. Um, so you're right, Chris. Technology changes so much. You know, the size of batteries, the length of charging. Uh, many of my friends, many, my few friends who have electric charging cars have put in their own um, charging stations at their house. It's just much more convenient. Um, so will we see more of that and less of the public ones? I, I did a little uh, check here online about the, um, um, the wording, the verbiage, and it basically says that all, all of these mean the same thing at this point, charging station, charging outlet, charging plug, charging port, because the, the stations that you buy some of some of them have one port, some of them have two, and who knows how that's going to change. So, you know, I I think you can either leave it the way it is, and and we mean that to be, you know, one car gets to plug in, or where we call it by spaces. You know, like David said, these are you know um, electric EV charging spaces. Undoubtedly, the, techn the the verbiage will change as well um, before anybody uses this. Although spaces seems likely to stay put. So if we're just like a space, a car, place to plug in, that seems pretty, pretty solid. Yeah, right. <clears throat> and if people um, wanted to maximize their conduit, they might put this two spaces together so that they would want 
the conduit and the stage trench. So, so do we want to try to word craft that first sentence? Or is Carolyn still trying to find data for us on that last on the parking lot behind City Hall? I'm still looking for the precise numbers, but again, um, I, the conversation you all had was that you thought it was pretty low for the number of spaces that were there. And the rationale was because they couldn't run the conduit into the parking lot to add more. So I don't know if you want to use that as the, you know, as the benchmark anyway. Um, but I- 31 D246, there we go. Well, I would suggest that we propose a number such as the 15, any expansion beyond 25 spaces, they must allow um, uh, 15 spaces, however that works, to be an EV space, um, one of 15. So if they're building something of 60, they're going to have four EV spaces and a brand new lot. And let's right. recommend that with those edits and throw it up to the council who will then have their own discussion about the reliability and sustainability of EV. It's true, whatever number we come up with, it, 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 it won't match, <laughs> probably. Right. Right. Is the there next a conversation, the next for EV space in the in the code? Because is there, the, what? is there a definition for an EV parking space in the code at all? But not in the, in the zoning. Because no. we could add one. We could, you know we could say, you know, designated parking with you know this signage and with the infrastructure to charge a car. You know. J1772 port or whatever, or maybe we don't want to get that specific, but then we could change that definition rather than changing the, the zoning itself. Well, the definition is in the zoning. So either way you would be changing the zoning. Um, I think when, because we'll only use it probably in one location, we're not going to probably create a definition separate for that because, um, and, you know, I think that you know, the, the stations come with their own signage, you know, as the package, obviously. So I don't know that we would want to define additional signage along with it. Um, but, and to also to your point about maybe we don't want to go into that level of detail, I think because the technology is changing so much um, that it, um, it certainly was our recommendation that we just say charging port or station, whichever term you want. And then the applicant can decide what level of charger they put in, you know, how big and so forth. So you said, uh, I heard 15, right? One, one um, charging um, station or port per 15? Keep the language port. Port or space? I would go with space. Port doesn't mean anything. Sorry. Okay. Charging yep. space. Okay. Uh, yep. I mean, unless it's like ships. <laughs> Sorry. Or that nasty wine. Yep. <laughs> it's good with chocolate after dinner sometimes. Do we want to look at that text one more time, Carolyn, or you just want to read it back to us? Um, let's see, put it up there. Let me just get back. Um, for new or expanded parking lots that result in the provision of 25 or more parking or more spaces, one electric vehicle charging space per 15 spaces shall be installed. And delete I would J. Move, I would move that we um, recommend uh, the adoption of that. Was 
Was that a second, Melissa? Yep, I would second that. So we're again, we're recommending the zoning uh, amendment with the edits that we made after this very robust discussion. We're moving this on to the legislative matters or the city council. Okie doke, any last discussion? And you know, I you know, just that it was good. You know, I, I appreciate Jana's comment that we're looking across the city at all of our work and how it impacts, you know, sustainability and our climate uh, climate goals. Um, and this one little piece, it's not quite the same as having a solar ready parcel, um, but it's certainly, again, kind of a message to developers and a message to our residents that we're moving in that direction. All right, so. Uh, why don't we, we didn't close the public hearing yet, just to be a uh, Robert's Rules of Order fanatic. Um, so let's just table our uh, motion for a minute. And can we have a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. A second. Second. All right, I think Sam had the second there first. All right, any discussion on closing the public hearing? All right, uh, so we'll move to a voice vote. Melissa? Yes. Yes. And David? Yep. And Chris? Yes. And Jenna? Yes. And Marissa? Yes. And Sam? Yes. All right, George uh, votes yes also. Caleb, we should give you a vote for hanging in here, but you got to wait, buddy. Um, so now we'll resurrect that motion that was made um, to recommend uh, the uh, this uh, ordinance as discussed and edited onto the city council. Any discussion at all? Okay, so we'll move it to a voice vote. Melissa? Yes. And David? Yes. Jenna? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Marissa? Yes. Sam? And George, so it's unanimous. Okay, thanks everybody. That was very, very interesting. I learned a lot. So we have a couple of more items. I think it's basically around minutes. There's no a and R today, Carolyn. Right. All right. We have minutes of September 9th and August 12th. Um, everybody had a chance to look at those. Make sure your name was spelled correctly and the votes taken and recorded correctly. Is there anyone who would, we could, I forget, do we move these forward as a package or do we take them one by one? We can do as package. I move to, okay. I move to approve the minutes. Of August page 12th by page. August 12th and <laughs> September 9th, 2021. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Thanks, Marissa. Any discussion? Okay. Let's go to that voice vote. Melissa. Yes. All right. David. Yep. Jana. Yes. And Chris. Yeah. And Marissa. Yep. Sam? Yes. Okay, another unanimous approval of the motion. We're in unanimity tonight. Is there anything else, Carolyn, that's on your plate? Nope. This is good. 8.43. I move to close the meeting. All right. Second. Uh <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Any discussion on adjourning the meeting at about 8.45? Okay, no discussion. Uh, Melissa, do you approve the closing of the meeting? I do. Okay, David? Mm, yes. Jana? Oh, certainly. And Chris? Yes. Okay, and Marissa? Yes. And Sam? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes also. Thanks, everybody.